I'd like you to welcome you to the IMWG conference series coming to you today from Amsterdam. Uh, this uh, conference series is coming after ASCO, uh, just after the IMWG summit and right before the EHA meeting, which is why we are here in Amsterdam. And so joining me today are uh, two myeloma experts uh, who are uh, present for our workshop and also uh, for EHA. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph McHale. Uh, who is uh, now based uh, in part at uh, the City of Hope and as well as uh, at Tijin in Phoenix. And uh, I have the pleasure to have him as the Chief Medical Officer at the International Myeloma Foundation. So welcome. Thank you. And uh, I'm especially pleased to have with me Philippe Moreau from the University of Nantes, uh, who has obviously been uh, very, very prominent in uh, myeloma research and clinical trials in, in recent years. So. What we're going to do today is review recently presented or published uh, data, and so we are going to focus primarily on uh, presentations from the recent ASCO meeting in Chicago, as well as upcoming abstracts at the EHA meeting here in Amsterdam. At the ASCO meeting, a huge number of abstracts uh, presented, uh, 5,600. Of those this year, 210 uh, related to myeloma, uh, eight oral presentations and uh, uh, quite, quite a number of, uh, of poster sessions. Uh, at the EHA meeting, uh, 199 myeloma-related abstracts. Uh, there are 13 oral presentations. Uh, there is one special oral presentation, which is uh, by Philippe Moreau, mm -hmm. who will be presenting his frontline trial data with the Cassiopeia trial that we'll be discussing in just a moment. 182 posters this year at uh, EHA. The topics that we will cover are five topics. We will move from early disease, smoldering myeloma, through frontline therapy options, uh, the use of maintenance, uh, relapse therapies, and of course, uh, the most exciting, uh, uh, the new agents uh, cur currently coming through uh, pipeline uh, trials. So let's start with smoldering myeloma. There were two important uh, presentations uh, at uh, ASCO and also coming up uh, here at, uh, at EHA. And uh, the first of those uh, was presented uh, at the ASCO meeting by uh, Marie B. Mateos uh, from Salamanca in Spain. And she was discussing smoldering myeloma as we transition from MGUS to smoldering myeloma to multiple myeloma. What are the practical practic practical factors that can be used to indicate a likelihood of progression. And the criteria for this particular analysis that she presented was what are the factors predicting progression at two years? And so she presented the results of a data gathering project where patients with smoldering myeloma, a total population of around uh, 2,500 patients gathered from around the world, were analyzed in terms of which factors predict progression at two years? And so from these data sets, uh, a scoring system, a scoring tool has been uh, developed which incorporates uh, the top four factors which indicate a uh, likelihood of progression at two years. And those four factors are the free light ratio, the level of the M component in the serum, the bone marrow plasma cell percentage in the bone marrow, and whether or not uh, high-risk uh, fish abnormalities are present. And as you can see on this slide here, on the right, it's possible to separate patients with a low score into uh, those with a very, very low risk of uh, progression at two years, and those with a score greater than nine who have a much higher risk. And if we look at this in graphic uh, Kaplan-Meier fashion, you can see in the high-risk case, 72.6% uh, at two years, 80% at three years are patients with a score of nine or greater using this system. And uh, the dominant factor that influences this is actually the tumor burden, which is reflected by the percentage of plasma cells in the bone marrow. Uh, but obviously the free light ratio and the height of M component is important. And the, the presence of abnormal fish does add a little bit. But it was also important to identify a very uh, low-risk group of patients who should certainly be excluded from uh, therapeutic interventions. As you can see over on the right, 
a 3.7% chance of progression at two years. The second study was a study in which uh, risk classification was used using actually some uh, somewhat broader criteria. And uh, this is a study presented by Sagar Lonio on behalf of the uh, ECOG group. And it evaluated the treatment, with, uh, treatment of patients with intermediate and high-risk myeloma uh, with lenalidomide or with observation alone. And uh, a lot of interest in this particular abstract. And the, the bottom line uh, results of this study is that uh, although there was overall uh, impact in terms of progression-free survival with the administration of lenalidomide, in this case lenalidomide uh, without uh, dexamethasone, what is shown on this slide is that the impact was really confined to the patients with truly high risk. And uh, there was not uh, a significant benefit in patients with intermediate or low risk uh, uh, disease. In contrast to this, uh, the updated uh, results from the CSER trial uh, are about to be presented here at EHA. In this case, uh, patients with high-risk smoldering are, are uh, treated with an aggressive pro approach, carfilzomib, uh, lenalidomide dexamethasone, plus autologous stem cell transplant. Mary B. Mateos will present the uh, results at a little short of three years, and these patients have done unusually well with this aggressive curative intent, overall survival 98%, PFS 94% uh, at the 30-month 30 uh, 30 uh, benchmark. And so from those data, uh, there are two important topics. Uh, one, where do we stand uh, with risk classification? And number two, where do we stand with treatment? We have uh, some benefit with uh, lenalidomide alone. Uh, we also have striking benefit with a very aggressive approach. And so uh, I'd like uh, to ask you both about your comments on, on both aspects. Perhaps, Joe, you'd like to comment sure, first. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the risk cl classification concept is so important to us, right? We, a few years ago, we redefined myeloma. We used to only define myeloma by having the CRAB criteria. Yeah. You know, the analogy I always give is that if I, if I go running today with my friend Philippe here, I don't have to wait till he's falling off a cliff to know we're in trouble if we're running near a cliff. Right. We used to define myeloma as literally falling off the cliff. Well, now we said, well, if you're getting really close, um, then we're going to be careful and we're going to pull you away from the cliff. And so right. we added those three criteria. And I think what this classification is doing is it helping us understand those people that are a little bit further away from the cliff in the smoldering group, uh, which ones of those are actually still at high risk of, of yep. getting into trouble with myeloma. So I think this kind of big database, 2,500 people, will hopefully lead not just to a risk classification of smoldering, it may with time help us further define the line of myeloma. There may come a day, I, I'm not going to be a prophet, but I think the day is going to come where we're going to have myeloma and basically MGUS and almost mm -hmm. remove the element of smoldering myeloma so that we know that trigger point to start treating. Right, right. I think the controversy right now is what to call that intermediate group. Is it still smoldering or is it early myeloma? I don't know. What do you think about that, Philippe? <laughs> I think that's very interesting because the uh, uh, criteria that were, uh, were selected into this classification are very simple, in fact. Yes. A free light chain, the percentage of plasma cells within the bone marrow, the increase of the um, component, mm -hmm. and the fish analysis, that's what we are yep. doing in routine. So this is, um, it is possible to use this classification for all patients. Yes. And then uh, I think that we should not treat patients too early but it's very good to be able to select a patient population that will progress uh, quite obviously uh, very, very soon. And then we need to develop clinical trials with an early intervention to find the optimal treatment for those patients. And then we have two uh, possibilities, either using a very aggressive strategy, such as um, um, the treatment proposed by the Spanish group, there is also a study ongoing in, in the U.S. US very yeah, similar, yeah, 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 uh, very, very similar, yes. With uh, all uh, new agents available and stem cell transplantation with the aim of curing patients. Exactly. But we need a very long follow-up to be sure that we may cure some patients. Or the other possibility is to use imid-based uh, regimens such as lenalidomide uh, in order to delay the time to progression. I'm not sure that we are going to cure patients with len alone. And this is a big issue because 
uh, on the long term, what are we going to do with, with land and Are we yes. going to propose land for five years, ten years? That's yes. It may be not uh, be not reasonable. Practical, so uh, practical and reasonable. So and, and cost these effective. are the options, <laughs> yes, mm. obviously. Yeah, and I think also that the concept there, we sort of get into a gray area between are you preventing a disease from happening or are you delaying it? And I know that may sound like similar things, but they're very different. I don't think anyone really believes that lenalidomide by itself can do no. this. You know, in your lab that you had many <laughs> years ago, you studied a lot of this, didn't you? Yes. Can, can yes. you affect the immune environment around myeloma cells to prevent them from becoming more active? Yes. It's, so, 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 it's a so tricky area. Isn't it, it is a tricky area, and my feeling is that it is uh, maybe unwise to be relying exclusively on some modulation as a prevention strategy. I think that ultimately uh, the disease is progressing because of intrinsic ge genomic changes, uh, and that's what we need to pay attention to. Uh, I mean, it's hard to ignore the fact that now we have two big trials that have shown a benefit of giving lenalidomide with or without absolutely, dexamethasone early absolutely. on. So I don't think we're dismissing that. I just think in my clinic tomorrow and seeing patients, I'm not jumping to treat everybody with high-risk smoldering myeloma. No. I, th I think, as you said before, we're probably going to redefine the disease a little bit more. But I think it's worth having a conversation with those patients now with a better risk stratification. And, and right. if I think my patient has a 70 or 80 percent chance of developing myeloma but in the next two years, I'm not going to wait for them to fall off the cliff. Let, let, let's Absolutely. do something before. Absolutely. But for all those patients before then, I think it's important to continue to watch. Absolutely. And so coming up, we do have a follow-on trial, which is uh, lenalidomide uh, DEX versus uh, DARA LENDEX. And so this will be very important. And then, as you said, we have the ASCENT trial, which is uh, the aggressive approach similar to the CSER study. So we will have new information about both of those. But I think, for me at least, in, in clinical practice, we should be quite cautious about how we uh, manage those patients.